What's up, Hyperfast Nation? On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with a real estate agent who's built a team in San Diego that consistently does over 40 million in volume a year. He's a national sales trainer and speaker. He's spoken at events like the National Association of Realtors Annual Conference, as well as Inman. He is also a father, husband, surfer, and triathlete. Welcome to the show, Jesse Zakorski. Welcome to the show, Jesse. How are you doing today? Doing great, Dan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's nice to. Uh, this is actually the first recorded podcast, by the way, in my new office studio, which not not completely set up yet. You see the empty shelves. So, do, uh, do we have a bottle of champagne to break on something to like to christen it? Yeah, we should. Carrie might get mad though. So, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. It's a good idea. Just that kind of reminds me of my Navy days, actually. That's, that's how they that's how they christen the new ships. There you go. Um, anyway, you're you're out there in a Navy town, uh, by the way, San Diego. Um, what uh, what do you think listeners should know about your background before we dive into uh, what's going to be a really interesting topic? Really, you know, the, the cardinal yeah. sins of uh, text, email, DMs. I, I know you've got a lot of good info on that and how you can uh, use those platforms the correct way to, to scale your real estate business. But before we dive into that, what, what should listeners know about you? Yeah. And when you're listening to a podcast, if it's someone new who's talking after a few minutes, their voice starts to blend into your head. It almost doesn't matter what their background is, but in case we have people listening going, why should I care? Um, just know I'm a real estate nerd. Like, <laughs> Like I must do, you, I don't know if you get a lot of guests on the podcast who self-describe themselves as a real estate nerd. I, I've been doing that this. That might be for, the first. <laughs> you think so? I think it is. I, I can't remember anyone saying that. But yeah. If, if, if I had like Jamie, you know, the Joe Rogan show, I could just be like, Jamie, look that up. But uh, <laughs> well, Jamie's we'll not here. It. So yeah. We'll, we'll Google it. But so, so assuming I'm one of your first, I mean, I've been, I've been doing real estate for 18 years and I have done pretty much every position in a real estate brokerage from being the broker of record, a team leader, teams as small as four, as big as 21 agents. You know, I've been a buyer's agent, a listing agent. I've answered phones. I've cleaned toilets. You name it. I've probably done it. I've been an inside salesperson booking appointments for other people. So I've, I've really kind of run the course in my career of doing just about everything in a real estate office. Which real estate's not, not every industry profession is like that. Real, real estate's probably one of the few where most of the people who've built successful teams, um, maybe it's not true for, for brokerage, but at the, on the team level, most of the people that, that have built a really well-run team have probably done a ton of the jobs. And you, do, you don't always get that in other industries. Yeah, it's, it's almost a trial by fire, like apprenticeship. I don't know if you were the same way, but when you just... If you're wired the way that you're just going to start doing stuff, I mean, I've been, I've studied with a lot of real estate coaches in my career, and I'm a big fan of having people that can help shorten the learning curve for you. But at a certain point, you just got to go out and do it and bump your head into a wall, right? You just got to take what they teach you and put it into action. And that's how I, a lot of the stuff that I teach now, I learned because I did it wrong. Like I, I screwed it up a bunch of ways. Did, have you, I mean, did you screw up a lot of things in your career or did it always go right for you? Definitely when, it, when I started to build a team, um, you know, that's, that's when I think you, you start making the, the mistakes compound, right? But you just have to get through them and really the, the more you fail, the more you'll succeed. So, you know, I've hired the wrong people, I've kept, the, kept people on for too long, you know, implemented the wrong like incentive structure, like, like the list goes on. That's actually the next thing Dan and I are going to record is a 17 part series of all of the mistakes we have made while running real estate teams. That's a joke. Uh, 
probably more than 17 parts, but yeah, yeah I mean, it'd be, it'd be a couple hundred. Yeah. But, but that's, that's how you learn. And so when it comes to you know the digital communication piece, um, we were selling a couple hundred homes a year. And at the time when I first started getting really nerdy about communication was when a lot of our clients were the banks. So back in the last downturn, I had a lot, I sold a lot of REOs. That was back in the early 2000s and uh, or mid, you know, 2008, 2009, that's when it started. And so since so many of our clients were email based, where literally they never picked up the phone, they could never, like they, you couldn't get them on the phone if you tried. I started getting really strategic and really conscious with my written communication. And that then lapsed over into text and now DMs and right. It's just, it kind of expanded from there. What, um, yeah, so let's, let's go into that more. And, and I know you've got the book coming out, which maybe you want to talk about that for a little bit, but you know, how did you use those platforms to scale and, and what, and consequently, what mistakes did you make along the way when, when you know, figuring this out? Yeah. So, so when you talk about scaling, the thing I love about written communication platforms are if you have other people in your world, be it an assistant, which I never call anyone an assistant. You can go down that rabbit hole for just a minute, right? I don't believe in the term assistant. I always had an operations manager, a director of operations, titles that make the person think and operate on a level where if they're just your assistant, they're waiting for you to tell them what to do. Does that make sense, Dan? Yeah, I I believe in that as well. I, I think it does two things, actually. One, it empowers them, like, like you said. But the other thing, too, is I think I think your clients don't feel handed off as much when they're dealing with someone who is an operations manager or, you know, I have a director of investor relations for what I do, right? Yeah. And, and I th you know, our agents on our team, the successful agents, uh, they, they get partner agents if they, once they hit a certain level, right? Because I'd, I'd rather have, you know, an agent who does 30 deals uh, a year, then hire them a partner agent and the two of them together maybe get to 50, right? Whereas the average agent isn't going to do 25 deals. They're going to do like 15. So I've increased the efficiency. But, you know, if, if we called them a showing assistant, uh, you know, the client's not going to like it if you're like, yeah, my showing assistant can show you that home or help you with the offer, right? Uh, you know, showing assistant, they, they just unlock the door. But a, a partner agent, well, they can show the home. They can do the inspections. They can talk contracts, right? So, it, so I'm, a, I'm a big believer in this concept as well. And, and that's what you just said is exactly how it ties into the digital communication piece. So assuming you have someone in your world for leverage, a partner agent, director of operations, and you don't want your client to feel passed off, right? If everyone in your world can write the way you do, and by write, I mean communicate, right? It's all about communication, which is, um, we'll go into a minute that kind of tra trans transmitter versus receiver orientation. But if in the world of communication, if everyone in your world communicates the way you do, then whether they're signing your name to an email or they're signing their own name, it almost doesn't matter because the most important thing is the information is getting communicated to the client in a way that helps them feel comfortable, which is all that really matters is how they're feeling. I agree with that? Definitely. Okay, so, so let's talk transmitter versus receiver orientation. I told you I'm a nerd, so I'm going to use big words. Right? I, transmitter I, and receiver, I like it. <laughs> I didn't make them up. It came from Malcolm Gladwell. You ever read any Malcolm Gladwell books? Yeah, I think I've, I think I've read all of them, maybe. I don't, I don't, unless he came out with a new one, I haven't. Ah, this, is, this is an older one. And this is just like a little tiny part, but I believe this is from the book Outliers. I'm almost positive it was Outliers. It could have been Tipping Point. But one of those two books, uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the differences in societies between transmitter and receiver orientation. And what he means is when someone's talking, whose job is it to make sure the information is being communicated clearly, right? In a transmitter society, the person doing the speaking is the one who's responsible to ask questions of the listener, right? Like if I was teaching you something right now, Dan, I would ask questions like, hey, does this make sense? Are we, right? That's a transmitter orientation. In a receiver orientation, it's the person listening who it's their job to ask questions in that culture to make sure that they've understood, right? If you were teaching me something, Dan, like you were just telling me about your partner agents and showing if it was a receiver orientation, I'd be asking questions like, okay, so, so, so the partner agents, 
they're doing X, Y, Z. Is that, am I understanding them? That's receiver orientation. Make sense? Correct. Yes, so, makes so sense. in, in and this, this kind of reminds me of, of, you know, cause we talked about the Navy earlier referenced my time in the Navy, but the Navy had this, like, especially in the nuclear engineering world, which I was a part of, they had this eight step communication process. And it was, you know, as an officer, you'd give the order, they would repeat it back. You would acknowledge that they would, they would tell you they were, uh, you know, they would report on them doing that action. Then you would, you would acknowledge that you heard it and then, and then, you know, so on and so forth. So it was a, a really almost cum cumbersome way, but in that world, when you're operating a nuclear reactor, you don't, you don't want to make a mistake. So, you know, you, you want to make sure that they are doing, that they're hearing what you, what you want to convey. And let's and let's go deeper in that because I, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. So when something as important as a nuclear reactor is on the line, they have put together this double triple check system. Did you ever get to the point where it became second nature or was it always cumbersome and, and annoying? No, it, after a while it it was just just how you operated. And and people would it would almost get to the 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 level where even if it didn't look like you were paying attention, you could repeat back the order like verbatim, which um, some, sometimes that annoys my wife, Carrie, because like she can think I'm tuned out, but then I can, I can repeat everything she said, like, I mean, word for word. <laughs> um, but so it, it, yeah, it, you know, eventually it becomes part of how you talk. Yeah. And, and that's what a lot of these same digital communication strategies that that I'm obsessed with do inside a real estate business. They're a little weird at first. If I told you, Dan, every time you're going to send a text to one of your clients, I want you to pause and reread it out loud before you send it. You'd probably think, I guess it makes sense, but actually getting you to do it, you'd be like, I'm not going to reread every text out loud. Do you know how many texts I send every all day? Right. I don't know for you personally how that would feel, but like if you actually started doing it and did it for about a week, you get to the point where it just became normal and you wouldn't think about it anymore. Correct. Yeah, you'd, you'd probably make less mistakes and um, get things right the first time a lot more, right? You know, you. I, I, I think that would kind of become. I think it would become second nature quickly, though. Like you said, it, it is, and, and so these are the things that in my own back office we've trained on, and to use your navy example, we've drilled on. Like we have, we do training and drills, and make sure that we people get it down that especially when we had all the bank owned homes, I don't do it as much these days with retail clients and the traditional buyers and sellers, but with bank owned clients, I would have people in my back office writing emails and signing my name to them all the time because the bank wanted it to come from us, but they didn't really care who wrote it with a, with a true, with a, uh, with a retail buyer or seller. I don't have them write emails for me. I have them say things like, Hey, I just talked to Jesse and here's what he wanted to, to communicate they probably didn't really talk to me. They probably just were saying it, but they look, pretend like I'm in the loop on it. Right. Reference me, And then they bullet point it out. And because it comes the same way using some of these strategies that, um, by the way, this is what I'm going to go deep on uh, at the, uh, the Hyperfast Summit. I'm going to give some really specific strategies, but at a high level, these are the things that you train on. And we get these pieces that become a part of just normally how you communicate and it makes your clients feel more comfortable. Well, before we, we continue with this, um, we should mention the hyper fast summer that's coming up soon. Uh, I'm excited just, in a, just in a few weeks here down in, down in Boca Raton, Florida, which I, I can almost see where the event is from, from my office up here you know, on the water. We're doing a VIP happy hour at our waterfront homes. So a lot of cool stuff. Uh, you know, we've got amazing speakers like yourself, Tat Londano, big TikTok HGTV realtor star out of Montreal. Uh, Jeff Fitzer, just a lot of great people that will, will help real estate agents expand their marketing, expand their lead generation, expand their conversion, which I think is you know what you are really good at through what we're talking about today, and really how to you know build a team that will not just give you more income, right? Because if you don't have time to go along with that income, what's the point in it, right? So that's what we're really focused on is how to build systems that grow even when you're not there. Uh, if you want to get tickets to that, 
hfasummit.com. Check it out. See if they're still available. If you're listening to this podcast, you can use the code podcast25 and get 25% off. That's podcast25 at hfasummit.com. Yeah. If, if it's the year 2027 and you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> they're probably still doing the Hyperfast Summit. So go ahead and, and check it out anyway. But if it is right now, right, it's going to be coming up in January of 2022. Uh, I'm excited about the event, Dan, because when you get that many like-minded people who want to scale and grow a leveraged real estate business, the speakers are awesome. I mean, don't, I'm not talking about myself, talking about all these other people. Like there's some amazing speakers you have, but it's just the group of people that are getting together in one spot. The synergy and what comes out of it is pretty incredible. I'm, I'm really excited about the event. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't wait. So, um, and, and you're, you know, you're going to go deeper into what we talk about today, oh. which is already pretty deep too. But, oh, like, I, can, I told you I'm a nerd. I can get way yeah. deeper, but look, look, I'm keeping it high enough that like to, to close the loop on that transmitter receiver orientation uh, conversation in our society without getting too deep. I mean, you really want to employ both modes, right? You don't want to rely on the fact that the person you're talking to will ask you questions if they don't get it. Right. Even though America does tend to be a bit of a receiver orientation, right? That's how America's mm. culturally is that people will ask questions and make sure they listen, but some of your clients don't. And so you have to take on that transmitter mindset of making sure you've communicated in a way and you check in with the person you're talking to. And when I say talking, I mean, in writing, in an email, in a text, in a DM that they get it. Like I just heard about an interaction today that was, I won't give details. doesn't matter, but it was like the, I, I was on a group text and the person had asked a question very specific, like, blah, blah, blah about a property ending with a question mark. And the person responded back with something that had nothing to do with what they said, but a totally separate challenge. And I was like, if you look at, like, if you listen to this conversation out loud, someone would think one of you is just like, I don't know, drunk stone, something like you're not even talking, but in text, because people are doing six other things, they didn't even know they had, they'd done that. Does that make sense? Well, the group, the group texts are challenging too, the bigger they get, because someone might make a comment up, up here in the chain and now like three or four things come in and then someone says something about something else and then you respond to that original thing and but it was right after that other point so I, I do like that new feature they added where on iPhones at least you can reply to you know specifically to a comment that's like way up above or you know from oh, yeah. earlier yeah and and this is where though even though I, I mean Again, you reference the book I'm writing, which is on the cardinal sins of text, DMs, and email. Um, this is not a plug for the book. This is just more of a comment of my world is so nerdy around digital communication. There are times when still getting on the phone makes more sense. When you've got six people on a text chain or six people on an email and you see it going back and forth and it's spiraling out of control, just shoot a quick text and say, hey, can we hop on a quick call and get on the same page? Sometimes you need a reset. If you're watching it, don't think that the medium you're communicating in is the one you have to stay in going forward. Sometimes you have to move up a level in terms of communication. What, um, I was gonna follow this up now. So, so read, read it out loud, um, you know, follow, follow up if, with a phone if, if you think it's yep. needed. Uh, is another principle to like always end with a, a question? Ah, uh, yeah, it depends on if you're looking for a response. Okay. So if you're talking about a text, a DM or an email, actually all three of them, if there is something that you want to get a response to, always, always, always end with a question mark and just one question. You've probably done this in a text. I'm guilty of it. You're going to go shoot a text off to someone and there's three things you want to ask. You ask all three things in a text in a big, huge paragraph and they don't <laughs> answer any of them. Or maybe they answer one and they ignore the other two, right? Especially in a text or a DM, you're only going to get one question answered. They're going to ignore the other ones and they're probably going to answer the last thing you asked them or whatever the easiest one is, right? If it's an email, you can sometimes get away with asking more than one question. But if you're writing a text and you say, let's just say it's a listing that you're trying to, you know, you're trying to get in front of. And you're like, yeah, so um, I'll be in your neighborhood next week. You know, you want to get together like, you know, Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday evening. Um, by the way, I was looking at the pictures of your, of your, uh, your house and the, the white carpet in the front living room does look like it needs to be replaced and blah, 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 something else, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you sandwich your question in the middle of all this other stuff you're saying, they're most likely going to ignore yeah. the fact that you asked them a question and just forget it. So yeah. Do I end with a question mark? If I want a response, I always end with a I mean, question or, mark. Or maybe you put the carpet remark as a PS. Um, I would do it first. I would yeah. say, I would flip it the other way. I would say, Hey, look, <laughs> looking at the pictures of, this is why I pause. I reread it out loud. And I actually look through it. I go, 
okay, it makes more sense to communicate this the other way. I start with, hey, I was looking at the pictures of your house. Carpet does look like it needs to be replaced in the living room. The white carpet looks a little faded. By the way, I'm going to be in your neighborhood next week. You want together together Tuesday afternoon or evening? Question mark. If, if you're asking a question, do you do you try to teach people to give, you know, two alternatives that both work for you? Like like would you, you know, for that listing question, I would always teach to say, hey, I'm in the neighborhood. Do you want to meet? Uh, Tuesday afternoon while I'm there or would Wednesday be better? I can come back then as well. Right. Yeah, Rather I than mean, like, do you want to meet? Cause then they can just say yes or no, as opposed to picking between two times. A hundred percent. It depends on, so that's, I was taught that technique is called an alternative choice right. close, right? It depends on who you're talking to and how responsive they are. Right. There's times when you don't need to give an alternative choice, but in general, I tend to, especially if it's a new prospect that you're looking to convert, I always give a couple options. Um, although I did give someone this morning, like if someone's ghosting you or they haven't responded lately, especially if it's something like work related, um, I'll, I'll ping someone and I'll say, hey, are you working this week? Question mark, which is a great question to ask someone, especially during the holidays, because legitimately people are taking time off and it gives them an easy response where they don't have to ignore you or ghost you. They can say, oh no, I'm actually out of town this week. And if they are around, it makes them really look like a jerk that they haven't been responding to you. If they, mm. So they're, they're usually, I'm, I'm working, what's going on? Like, and then you get a response out of them. Um, so there are times when I don't give an alternative choice. If they haven't responded to two other alternative choice message texts, I'll shoot just a generic like, hey, you're around this week? Hey, you're working this week? Uh, what, what else um, when it comes to you know, emails, texts, DMs, should people do or, or don't do conversely? Yeah, so... And then, and then also, I think another one too, is like, how do you, how do you use it to scale? Right? Like if you want to communicate with more than one person at a time, do you get into those techniques in the, in the book or. Absolutely. Yeah? So okay. a lot of this has to do with automating and authentic engagement, hmm. right? Automating authentic engagement. What I mean by that is the types of things I'm teaching can be done one-on-one -on -one in a straight up, in a group, or if you're trying to blast out messaging, that's going to scale to a larger list, right? These days, most people can tell if something is a blast. And so if you're going to make it as a blast, you either want to lean into it and be like, hey, here's our email newsletter. I'm giving an update. Great. Or if you're really going to have it feel like it's a one-to-one -one communication, but you're doing it at scale to like, let's say you got a hundred leads in your database and you want to ping all of them and text them all and say, hey, you, you, know, you still look, haven't talked in a while, you're still looking for a house this year or whatever the, the text is going to be. Yeah, you want to make sure you're using the same techniques that are going to apply. And there might be times when you want to, um, whatever you're communicating, you want to make sure you're, again, even more so if you're sending it out to like 100 people, you're reading it out loud, you're formatting it correctly. I use bullet points in a text message by using emojis, either a little green checkbox or the finger pointing emoji. I'll put things like that, especially if you're going to use this to scale out. Um, to a bunch of different people, I would use those same techniques. I would do one-on-one, -on -one, but just do it at scale. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So you're, you're either, I guess there's two methods here. You can either own the fact that this is going to a lot of people yep, or you can try to automate it personal, which I've seen some people before they'll, they'll do like the scent from iPhone at the bottom or um, I've, I've even contemplated before, like, inserting grammatical mistakes because it looks like you were, you know, banging that on your, on your phone or something. Um, you can do that. Yeah. But I, I, I go back and I edit out my grammatical mistakes, even one-to-one. -one. Like that's the thing is like, I, I don't use really big words when I'm talking in a text to, especially to clients or people. Like I try to write at a second or a third grade level. Right. But I do like to write in concise like English language, right? So like if, if your client sends you these long paragraphs and they have all these typos and they're using all, like you can tell like they just didn't, like I'm still gonna write back in like the correct words. I'll be, I'm not gonna do this big scrolling paragraph of text. I'll be in rapport. I'll use the same type of words they use, but I'll spell things right. I'm, I'm not, I don't know if you look at like, you know how kids text these days. I don't need, I see adults that text with like these little short codes for things. I'm like, you're a, you're a 40 year old man like me or you're a so and such year old woman. You don't need just to, quicker. <laughs> it's quick. It's quicker. But what if the person you're writing to, like, do you write with lots of abbreviations in your text? No, not not typically. I, I think you you got to know your your audience, match them, and you know. Your and I, and I think I think when talking to the masses, it's an interesting point. 
the second, third grade level, unless you have a highly segmented list of people that are, you know, communicated at a higher level, the, the second, third grade reading level for the masses is quite effective. I think after the 2016 election, when Trump got in, they, I think they did a study on like the level of communication. I think it, I think I remember it being typically at a second, and third grade level. Yeah. And that, that just worked well for the masses. Yeah. And it, do, it doesn't mean condescending. Like if you know bigger words, doesn't mean you're supposed to talk that, but just truly keeping it to its simplest core. I mean, this goes with right. communication and this is, I hate to harp on the whole, like reread your message and reread it out loud, but this is where so many people go wrong is because they think they're communicating one thing and they haven't gone back to realize they actually didn't say what they meant to say. How do you, how do you batch doing this? Let's, you know, you, you, before we start the show, you talked about, you know, you're on two day mountain trip recently with your family, yeah. no cell phone, which is awesome. Um, you know, how do you, how do you effectively do the DM texting in particular or email, I guess too, but like in a way where you, you get back to people promptly, but, but it's in a certain batched process or in a way that's not going to, you know, end up with you attached to your phone when you're with your family. Yeah. So, so when I took off two days in the mountains right over Christmas and was just like literally phone in the drawer, there were people I didn't get back to quickly because I, I've saw, I haven't saw the way I saw that was by having other human beings in my back office that were the people who anyone with something time sensitive knew not to send it to me. Cause I, I proactively communicated with them and said, Hey, mm. I'm be off grid. You need something, go to this person. All right. I, I set that expectation up in advance with our buyers and sellers. We do have um, anyone else. I mean, I looked through my messages. I think I came back and had about 40, 41 unread text messages over two days. Cause it was the holidays anyway. And the vast majority of them were people saying Merry Christmas to me. Right. And I, and I didn't respond to them. And this morning I cut and pasted a message for if anyone got one of these from me, they'll know that it was now it's cut and paste. Sorry. I'm just going to tell them what I did. This is how I batched it. My response was thanks exclamation point. I took a couple of days off my phone, smiley, fa smiley face emoji. Hope you had a wonderful Christmas exclamation point. That's a pretty generic message that still communicated. Cause I read this, but like I noticed everybody had sent me the same thing and I didn't want to like, you know, be a jerk and not respond to these nice messages from these people right. in the world that wish me well, but did it matter that they sent it on Saturday and today's Monday and I just sent it two days later? No, I doubt they were waiting around being like, can't believe Jesse didn't respond back to my text. No, they're busy doing their thing. Yeah. I like the cut and paste technique. I've, I've even done like text replacement feature on the iPhone. You, you can go into settings and enter a, a sentence or word or whatever. And, and so Oh, you know, oh, I, 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 yeah, I do that. I, I, but, but, there, but I do that, but I use that more for links. So like I use a certain YouTube video, I send it out a lot or a link to a video on our site. I'll type the letter three N, which will break out the code. And like, do you use text replacement for like an entire message or how do you use text replacement? I'll, I'll use it for links and for messages. So like, I'll, I'll get a lot of messages for people that are like, Hey, I mentioned being a real estate agent or joining your team. So I've, I've got a text replacement that will direct them who to email on the team or, you know, other, other like frequently asked questions that I get from social media. Um, they're typically getting some text replacement type response, which you can also, I think a lot of the platforms like have automated responses as well, but, um, yeah, but, but I kind of like the text replacement because then I can put my own twist on it if I want to. So T totally. I, I use actually the, so I'm an, I'm an Apple guy also. I use the note, just the straight up notes, uh, yeah. app on the, on the iPhone. And then you can pin notes. So they're at the top. So I'm just looking like I have four notes pinned that are my most common things I use. And the reason I don't use a text replacement is because they're long enough that I want to be able to edit little pieces of them. So I'll go copy and paste it from notes and then edit it. The text replacement, I just use more for, for links. The notes, the notes is one of the most underrated apps on, on Apple. I, I use that one a lot as well. So it got really good. It used to kind of yeah. be kind of, kind of bad. We used to use Evernote. Now I never use Evernote anymore. I just use the notes built into the Apple. Well, you can add things to it and share it with people. Like, you know, everything I would want in it, basically you can yeah. do. So, yeah, no, it's awesome. And it syncs with my computer and everything else. So, um, the other, if you're talking about scaling like that using text replacement, um, another thing that you might want to look at is the reach app. 
Have you ever used Reach, R-E-A-C-H? I have not heard of the Reach app. So I believe it's free. If it's not free, it's like $4. It's something really cheap, but it allows you to create a group of people, save that of your contacts in your phone, as many different groups as you want, and then you can draft messages and send them to the group of people, but it sends individual messages instead of to a group. So it looks like I'm sending one-on-one. -on -one. I still have to click the send button. Like to send to 50 people, it's going to take me maybe, I don't know, four minutes because I got to go next. Like I just have to, but it auto that's, that's text or DM or both? Text. It's just text. a text-based okay. app. I think there might be a DM version um, for Facebook or for uh, Instagram. I don't know. I have to double check that. But I use it for text because this is actually a, a really good thing that we should talk about before we run out of time. Um, the circle of trust. You ever, you ever watch the movie Meet the Fockers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Yep. You're coming in the circle Robert, of trust. Robert Fokker. De Niro. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> You're in the circle of trust, Fokker. So I believe that most human beings have a circle of trust for their digital communication. So I was trying to find out this. We were still on today to record, Dan. I'm looking and I didn't have your cell number saved. I'm like, I don't have Dan's number. I'm looking like I could message him on, on a Facebook or wherever. I'm like, eh, whatever. I'll just, I'll just jump on. He'll probably be here. And sure enough, you were here. But here's the thing. If you and I knew each other really well, how do you think we would communicate? What, what method of communication? Text, email, Instagram, DM, pro probably one of those three. Okay. And if I... And your closest friends, do they tend to Instagram DM you, email you, or text you? Uh, closest ones are probably on, on text, my text. cell phone. Yeah. So you're just like most human beings. And that's what I want people to listen to. I'm always trying to graduate to another level of communication because it subconsciously it puts you into that level of, right? If I'm texting with you, I must be one of your closer friends just at that level versus I don't have my close friends. They don't DM me. Cause I've known, they've known me forever. Some of them don't even text me. They just call me my buddies from like, you know, high school. But I started to use uh, signal as well. So I've got some friends that like were only on signal. I don't even know what signal uh, is. What's signal? Yeah. It's, it's, it was one of the top um, messaging at, or top apps overall downloaded. So another kind of nerdy habit I have just since you like these nerd terms, I like to review what apps are the most downloaded on Apple. And Signal popped up in January of this year, a year ago, uh, in the top five, you know, I think it was number one for a time, but it's, it's a messaging app that's decentralized. No one, no one's making money off of it. So it's, you know, the, the people that are concerned about privacy really like it because um, they're not, you know, we definitely know with WhatsApp, you know, the Facebook one, like they're, they're reading your, your stuff to, start with <laughs> ads. and you know, it's probably the most part benign, but you know, there are people that are suspicious and, but, I, but I'm also, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if I ever heard that Apple is reading your text to, you know, figure out what to advertise. Right. So signal signal is just a, a private decentralized, more secure form of messaging and, Cool. I, I will download it now. A lot of my, a lot of my friends like using it. <laughs> it. It looks a little like WhatsApp. Yeah. It's kind of like WhatsApp, but uh, without Mark Zuckerberg spying on you. I did, did. Does Facebook own WhatsApp? Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Oh man. So that means, that means I'm getting, and not to go down the rabbit hole, the privacy conversation, but I actually don't mind them listening for the most part. It tends to give me ads for better things that I care about. It still is pretty creepy though. Sometimes when you're just like talking about something and then the ad shows up on your phone seconds later, you're like, I think you're probably right in most cases, but um, it is scary. Like how much access to private and or sensitive personal or business information, you know, Google or, or Apple potentially has access to. So. Oh, oh I, I agree. It's scary. <laughs> I mean, it's, I had to stop reading the book. It was called uh, future crimes. Did you ever read that one? No. Future crimes. It was all about really, really well-written, you know, technical histor technological historian used to work with the CIA or the FBI and just kind of putting things together and talking about where the potential pitfalls are in our digital society. Oh, dude, <laughs> I, I stopped reading that with you. I'm like, I don't even want to know. I can't do anything about this stuff. I'm out. Uh, text, texting, you know, for the most part, but maybe it's being replaced by a texting app. <laughs> right. And, and so whatever it is, though, if you just consider the framework of whoever you're talking to, it might be different. For most human beings, it's still text being the center of that trust circle, right? If I'm only Facebook messaging with someone or Instagram DMing, 
and they don't really use it that often. And then, but if they're all about Instagram DMs, great, I'll stick there. But even people that are all about Instagram, I still find that like text is their, they check, they check text first before they check Instagram. And so I want to figure out what the way they communicate is and make it closer to the center of that, uh, what they look at first, which app they look at on their phone first. I'm, I'm probably evenly split between tech, checking on text versus Instagram, just because okay. I get a fair amount of uh, direct messages and I, I like to see and interact and kind of know what people are responding to. So I'm, yeah. I'm curious about it. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't use the LinkedIn messaging thing at all because it's, it's just flooded with like spam. I, I would call it almost um, like flooded. So I don't, so if you ever send me a message on LinkedIn, like I'm not going to respond. I just followed you on Instagram now though. So there you go. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to message you here. So this will be until we trade cell numbers, this will be the new way I'll, I'll message you here. And then the Facebook messenger app, I would, that's like level two or three, you know, I'll, I'll use it, but if like, like I'll, I'll take action on something a lot quicker if it's, if it's in my text. Um, so. So that's your actionable item. People listening, yeah. like you want to get into people's, te- no, you do. And this is where I've had, you know, people that work with me that are, they're Facebooking back and forth with someone, they're messaging. And then they're like, they stopped responding. I'm like, did you text them? No, I don't know their cell number. Why, <laughs> why not? Well, when they were responding before, I know, but even though they're responding, you always want to get all methods of communication and figure out which way you can go to. Cause even though they check Facebook messenger for like a week, maybe they stop next week, but no one ever stops checking texts. They don't. That's always my yeah. guess. Yep, I agree. Um, well, dude, let's let's go deeper on this at the Hyperfast Summit. Oh, I can't wait. I hope I hope as many listeners as as possible that are hearing this, you know, will will we'll be there. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff to go deeper on, and you know, Carrie and I are going to be bringing people to help with all all parts of the scaling, whether it's getting more leads, converting more, or, or building the team to serve them. So. Uh, you know, Jesse, you'll be one of the speakers, a lot of other amazing people as well. It's hfasummit.com and you can use the code podcast25 to get 25% off tickets if they're still left. So hfasummit.com, code podcast25. Uh, before we wrap up, Jesse, I always do a hyper fast round if you're ready for some rapid fire questions and answers. All right, what's your biggest piece of advice to a new real estate agent? Never, ever, ever give up. What's a mistake you see successful agents making? They stop doing something that works. What's the biggest challenge you've had in business and how did you overcome it or what did you learn from it? Biggest challenge I had was lack of consistency early on in my career. I kept seeing the most successful people in the room and I'm a big fan of modeling after behavior, but seeing the most successful people just doing these things over and over and I wasn't wired that way. So I had to recalibrate my brain and develop some new habits to really go deep and master things and they get really consistent and it's served me well in my career since then. And what, uh, are, what would we find you doing when you're not working on your real estate business? Number one, I'd be a dad. So I think you yeah. and I share, I'm, I got a three and a six year old. So I am, if dadding was a verb, I would be dadding most of the, uh, most of the time. But when I'm not with my kids and not working, it's uh, playing guitar, surfing. I used to do triathlons. So doing something outside active, um, but these days it's mainly just being a dad. Awesome. I, I've uh, done quite a few triathlons as well. And, oh, nice. and I'm a dad. So uh, <laughs> last one, uh, where do you see yourself five years from now? Five years from now would be 2026. Um, I'm going to be probably running a fairly large uh cloud-based brokerage organization, as well as um, involved in my underlying goal is always to make the biggest impact possible, the biggest positive mm-hmm. impact. So we have, an, we have an event we're working on, which will be at Madison Square Garden in the year 2025. So I'd say five years was just past doing a, a sold out event at Madison Square Garden, making a pretty large impact on a, on a big scale. And I'll tell you more about that next time we chat, but uh, that's, that's the vision. That's where I'll be. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to, uh, to, to learn more about the event in Madison Square Garden. Excited to have you at the Hyperfast Summit in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, February 1st and 2nd. Uh, 
this has been awesome. I can't, I can't wait though for, for you to actually go live and go, go deeper at the summit. Before we sign off today, if people want to connect with you, how should they do that? They can find me on any social platform as long as it's Facebook or Instagram, not LinkedIn. Because I'm like you. I don't really check my LinkedIn messages ever. <laughs> but uh, at Jesse Zagorski, Z-A-G-O-R-S-K-Y, in case they're like jogging along listening to audio, right? Just hit me up on Facebook or Instagram. Um, I do read my DMs and I will respond back as a real human being. Maybe using text replacement, but most likely I'll actually write it out. By hand. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show today. And to all of our listeners and viewers out there, thank you for tuning in. Uh, please let us know what you thought of the show. Leave us some feedback, good, bad, and ugly. We like it all. And share this episode with other people you think would benefit from watching or listening to it. We'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hyper Fat Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyper Fat Shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests, improve our shows, and give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you want to see more, click right here. And if you want 100 real estate tips from my best-selling book, click right here to download them instantly. And if you're new to this channel, click below to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out. And leave some comments about what you think on the videos.